Welcome to the Center for 21st Century Studies lecture. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First, I would like to remind everyone that at the end of April, that the last Thursday through Saturday of April will be our conference. It's entitled The Big No, and we're going to have Ariana Reigns, Frank Wilderson III, Francois Laruelle, Katerina Kolotsova, and Joshua Clover here, as well as something, I think at this point, it's gonna be about 12 breakout sessions of scholars from, at this point, three different continents, uh, all coming together to talk about questions having to do with refusal, naysaying, and the power of no. It is free to the public. You are invited and encouraged to come to whatever parts you'd like to come, so please keep that in mind. Uh, the second announcement I'd like to make is that as of, I believe, yesterday, the center has published a book called Anthrop Anthropocene Feminism, edited by Richard Grusin, who's sitting in back. Did it come out yesterday? Um, a few days ago. A few days ago, okay. And uh, so, so that came from a conference of ours about uh, three years ago, and I invite everyone to look for that book. It's a, it's a great collection of essays. Um, I also want to say sort of a third announcement. At the end of this, uh, uh, at the end of the lecture and Q&A around five o'clock, you're all invited up to the ninth floor of Curtin for a reception that will be happening there. To introduce our speaker, I would like to ask up our own Carolyn Eichner uh, from the Department of Women and Gender Studies and the Department of History, or the Department like Body of Women and Gender Studies and the Department of History um, to, uh, to introduce you to Camille Robesey. Thank you, Kenan. Hello, everyone. I'm extremely pleased to be introducing Camille Robesies. Camille is an associate professor of modern French history at Cornell, focusing broadly on intellectual and political history. Among her many awards and honors, Professor Robesies was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Penn Humanities Forum in 2008 and 2009 a fellow at LAPA, the Law and Public Affairs, at Princeton in 2011 and 2012, and a member in the, Institute for, in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton in the spring of 2016. Her list of influential publications includes her book, The Law of Kinship, Anthropology, Psychoanalysis, and the Family in 20th Century France which examines the ways in which debates over French family law engaged anthropological and psychoanalytic academic concepts, shedding new light on the particularities of French political culture, questions of the nature of sexual difference, and the nature of French republicanism. Professor Robesy's articles and chapters include China in Our Heads, Althusser, Maoism, and Structuralism in Social Text in 2012, Republicanism and the Critique of Human Rights in France Since the 1970s, History, Politics, and Memory in an Age of uncertain Uncertainty, edited by Emile Chabal in 2014, and Francois Toquel and the Psychiatric Revolution in Postwar France in Constellations 2016. One of the things that Professor Ropsies does quite brilliantly in her work is to engage and articulate the complex meanings of ideas and norms within French politics and culture, and the ways in which these meanings circulate in a global intellectual and sometimes anti-intellectual context. In each case, she highlights for the reader not only the foreignness of another culture's norms, but also the strangeness of our own. For example, in her 2015 article in the Journal of Modern History titled Catholics, the Theory of Gender, and the Turn to the Human in France, a New Dreyfus Affair, Professor Robesies examines the rhetoric and politics of the intense protests that arose in opposition to, the le to legalizing gay marriage, demonstrating the ways in which the right-wing assertion of the profound dangers of a socially disruptive, un-French, monolithic theory of gender was used to refute arguments of equal rights for women, lesbians, and gays. 
The image she gives us of priests and neo-Nazis discussing Judith Butler is indelible. In her 2015 piece in the South Atlantic Quarterly, titled The Biopolitics of Dignity, Professor Robsis investigates the role and development of the concept of human dignity in French law, addressing issues including rhetoric regarding France's national indignity in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attacks, and the 2010 law banning face coverings in public spaces, she convincingly argues that the idea of human dignity has shifted from being considered a human value to becoming a tool of biopolitical rule. Today, Professor Robsis is going to speak to us about her project on the history of institutional psychiatry, a post-World War II psychiatric reform movement in France. The title of her talk is The Politics of the Psyche. Please join me in welcoming Camille Robsis. Hi, thank you so much, Carolyn, for this warm and generous introduction. And uh, so before I begin, I just want to thank Kenan for inviting me today and the Center for 21st um, Century, uh, especially Cal Heck and the entire staff who have made this visit really just a, really a joy. So it's my first time in Milwaukee, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, so I thought what I would do today is tell you a little bit about this, this book that I am in the, really in the midst of writing, um, which I just found a new title for, The Politics of the Psyche, Psychiatry Beyond Marx and Freud. Um, and I know that this, the theme of the center this year has been naysaying, and to a large extent, um, naysaying was central to the figures that appear in this book, how to say no politically but also psychically, um, and, and sort of trying to think about the relationship between will, uh, which is determined by the ego, and desire, which is something that comes from the unconscious, and the fact that the two often, uh, that the two often conflict, so have try to think about this conflict. Why sometimes when you say yes, you mean no, and why sometimes when you say no, you mean yes. I'm sure it's something you've talked about this year, but anyway, I'll return to this at the end. Um, and this is actually an image, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think, it was, it's an image that I thought could work well as the cover <laughs> for the book. Um, which is one of my favorite things is thinking about covers of books, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a photograph by a, an Italian artist, Pennone, but what I like about it is that Jean-Henri, who I will talk about in a second, uh, compares schizophrenia to an uprooted tree, so, so it made me think of, and he had a, an image of an uprooted tree in his office, so that's why I was thinking it would work well. Okay, so there's um, five sections to the talk today. The first one is called Psychic and Political Occupations. Uh, from 1940 to 1945, during the German occupation of France, 40,000 patients died in French psychiatric hospitals. As in much of the French territory during these years, hospitals suffered from food shortage, rationing, and harsh living conditions. However, as historians in recent years has, have suggested, these deaths were not only due to hunger and cold as it was previously believed, but also to a specific policy of extermination geared towards the mentally ill that the Nazi state promoted and the Vichy regime silently endorsed. In Saint Alban, so these are the two books that have come out that kind of uh, have put their finger on this uh, exterminatory mission of, of psychiatric patients during World War II. In Saint Alban, a small and remote town in central France, one psychiatric hospital tried to resist and feed its patients by hoarding extra food with the help of the local population. Alongside these efforts to secure food, various doctors at Saint Alban began to rethink the practical and theoretical bases of psychiatry. As the war in fascism had made clear, occupation was not simply a physical condition, it was also a state of mind. Psychiatry needed to think about this connection between the political and the psychic if it wanted to truly disoccupy the minds of its patients. This movement that began at Saint Alban and that influenced many clinics in France and abroad during the second half of the 20th century came to be known as institutional psychotherapy. This is the hospital before the war. So the, my goal in this book is to trace the history of institutional psychotherapy from its inception at Saint Alban to its various incarnations in the post-war years, so basically from around 1945 to 1975. 
The book begins with an analysis of Saint Alban during the war, focusing on one of the most important theorizers and practitioners of institutional psychotherapy, François Tosquelles, uh, whom I will tell you about in a moment. The other chapters are organized around individual case studies of doctors, intellectuals, and artists who were either physically present at Saint Alban or for whom the Saint Alban experiment was very important. These include Franz Fanon, who was a medical resident at Saint Alban in 1952-1953, and who relied on many of the principles and techniques of institutional psychotherapy in his psychiatric work in North Africa. So here, um, let's see if there's so Black Skin, White Masks, the book where Fanon is perhaps most explicit about the psychic effects of, of, of race. Um, the hospital where Fanon worked for a couple of years in Algeria during the war, Lida Joinville, and where he really put in practice a lot of the experiments that I will discuss in this paper, uh, in, in, in his practice. Uh, this is his psychiatric writings that were, have just been collected in one anthology, which is making my life much easier. Um, but he has a lot of really kind of hands-on practical advice for psychiatric um, work. They, it also included Georges Canguilhem, the historian of science who hid at Saint Alban in 1944 while he was in the resistance and who turned to psychiatry to rethink the notions of normal and pathological. Michel Foucault, who was Canguilhem's student, mentioned Saint Alban in his course on psychiatry at the Collège de France and his early work also focused on the psychiatric as a lens to think through power and knowledge. Jean Houry, finally, uh, the psychiatrist who in 1951 founded the Clinic of Laborde, where Félix Guattari worked for several years. So this is Laborde, Houry, um, Guattari, and uh, Laborde, which in many ways inspired the, the book that Guattari co-wrote with Gilles Deleuze in 1972, Anti-Oedipus. So this is, um, uh, this is some of Guattari's more psychiatric writings. Um, this one you might see, this, the, the Psychonauts and Transversality, this is actually a picture of the, of the Laborde Castle that I just mentioned to you, so where Guattari worked. And this is a, a book that, Guattari, that was published not that long ago where, he, where Guattari talks about kind of the, role of the, uh, or the, the, the role of the asylum in schizophrenia. During the war, Saint Alban also welcomed surrealist artists who were fleeing fascism and who had been fascinating by madness long before, such as Paul Éluard. So this is a book that Éluard wrote uh, after his time at Saint Alban. Um, and the grave, uh, one of uh, the cemetery of Saint Alban, uh, one of the poems of Éluard that is on one of the, uh, of the graves. Um, and also a series of visual artists associated with the movement of Art Brut. So two examples here. Auguste Forestier, um, who this is some of the work he produced, and perhaps more famously, Du Buffet, who also was at Saint Alban. Uh, and you can understand why madness would be appealing to these artists who were trying to go beyond the conventional dictates of the art world, right? So, when I discovered all these connections, I thought it would be interesting to write this history and to try to understand why all these thinkers who were somehow associated with Saint Alban brought together psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and politics in this particular period after World War II. So that's, that was the immediate goal of the book. Um, but I'm also hoping that the book will intervene in three broader debates or conversations. Um, so let me just tell you about these before I tell you more specifically about the book. The first, uh, the first sort of broader conversation is to re-examine the relationship between the psychic and the political through this particular cast of characters who believed, one, that psychiatry could be political, and two, that politics needed to take seriously the libidinal. Unconscious drives, affect, and desires were not di displacements of a more accurate material reality, whether it be class interest, capitalist hegemony, or social structure, as many Marxists believed. And all of these things could also not just be subsumed by reason, as many liberals believed. For these thinkers, desire was constitutive of the political. Social and psychic alienation needed to be studied and addressed together. Or as Fanon put it, all political leaders should be psychiatrists. And this is something, I mean, you know, I was just talking to some people before, how one goes in and out of love with one's projects. Um, but one of the reasons I think that I'm really excited about this project again now is uh, since the election, the, the election of Trump, um, 
I think I've been thinking a lot about uh, why the left has abandoned this interest in the psyche when all these, the, these growing right-wing populist movements all over the world are clearly able to channel desire and fantasy and to present themselves as an alternative to liberal rationalism. And I think that without a psychic framework, it's very hard to understand the appeal of someone like Donald Trump, uh, the sense of exhilaration and fanatical intoxication that was evident at his rallies. So returning to a notion of libidinal politics would allow us to move to move beyond two things. One, the false consciousness model, this idea of like they voted against their interests. Um, no, in fact, they voted because that was their desire, right? And on the other hand, the kind of debate of was it class, was it gender, was it sexuality, uh, was it race? And in fact, it was all of the above because as these thinkers make clear, libidinal economy and political economy are one. They're indissociable from one another. So I think, in this particular moment, I'm excited to rethink about these, this, this particular current on the left that was very much invested in these questions. The second larger goal of the project is to think about the structure of physical and psychic enclosure more generally. Indeed, all of the figures in the book insisted on the fact that their experience of occupation had been foundational for their medical and theoretical insights. Tosquelles, for example, attributed his desire to reform psychiatry to his life, first as a Catalan anarchist fighting in Spain and fighting Imperial Spain and Soviet authoritarianism, later in a Spanish refugee camp uh, in, in France, and finally as a doctor in Vichy, during the Vichy administration. For Fanon, the colonial context generated a series of specific psychic effects that a decolonial psychiatry needed to grasp and to fight. Deleuze and Guattari were similarly mobilized by what they called the fascisms that had persevered after World War II, the mental structures that trapped desire and immobilized the people. The, quote, them quoting Foucault here in, the, in his introduction to Anti-Oedipus, the fascism that causes us to love power, to desire the thing that dominates and exploits us. And Foucault, finally, who invented his concept of subjectification or assujettissement to describe this double process of subject formation and disciplining, a disciplining process that he examined through the lens of the asylum and the prison, two institutions premised on enclosure. So can we think about occupation as a structure with physical and psychic consequences? What do the camp, the colony, the settlement, the prison, the hospital, and other forms of confinement share in common? What would a disoccupied society and an emancipated psyche look like? And here I'm in conversation with the various uh, contemporary critical theorists who have tried to think through these questions around the colony, the camp. Um, in Achille Membe's new book, he calls it the, the forme camp. Uh, so what is the, where again the kind of psychic effects of this, of enclosure. Related to this, I also hope that the book can contribute to the conversation in philosophy and political theory that has tried to reimagine a new common. And again, there's been a lot written about this, uh, but I'm thinking, for example, here of the recent book by Pierre Dardot and Christian Laval, Commun, uh, also of Kristen Ross's revisiting of the Paris Commune, or of Judith Butler's latest book on assembly, but also of movements such as Occupy, Los Indignados, Nuit Debout, all of which try to conceive a different horizontal and radically democratic social, which is, I think, again, something that a lot of these thinkers at Saint Alban had in mind. For the figures that I'm studying, just like psychosis could tell us a lot about subjectivity in general, the psychiatric hospital could also offer a template to rethink the social. This is why in the book I refer to the psychiatric hospital as a laboratory of political invention. Institutional psychotherapy was an attempt to set up a form of community that would systematically destabilize centers, authorities, and powers, a permanent revolution of the social and the mind at once. Finally, uh, last, the third point, the, the, the book is engaged in a historiographical reflection as it strives to be both a microhistory, so a story of this one particular hospital, um, and a transnational study extending beyond France to Algeria and Spain, a sort of transnational microhistory. My aim here is not to claim that Saint Alban was the sole origin of this diverse intellectual production, but rather to explore the role that a particular setting can have in fostering ideas. As an intellectual history, this project seeks to establish a dialogue between texts and their contexts, to map networks of idea and to trace reading practices. The individual case studies in this book, in this book make up a constellation of characters 
who are not, that are not generally examined together. In this sense, I'm interested in exploring how the history, not only of modern psychiatry, but also of what is usually referred to as French theory, <laughs> shifts with this particular cast of characters in these particular locations. Okay, so that was the longish overview of the, of the book. Uh, now let me tell you more specifically about one of the characters that I focus on, François Tosquelles. Um, Tosquies is central to my story, not only because, and you see him, he's actually holding the boat of the Alboit guy, Forestier, that I was talking about here, and he's standing on the roof of the hospital. Tosquies is central to my story, not only because he was one of the founding fathers of institutional psychotherapy, but because he was a very important mentor for Fanon, for Uri, and for Guattari. And this is, uh, when, whenever I teach Fanon, the, my students always ask me if, like, if, and I know there's a big debate about this, whether Fanon was a Lacanian or not a Lacanian. In fact, I think, if anything, Fanon was really um, a Tosquelian more than anything else. Um, that was the kind of real uh, theoretical reference in his, that goes throughout his work. So I want to put forth two arguments concerning Tosquelles. Uh, one, that he played a key role in the dialogue between psychoanalysis and psychiatry in 20th century France by bringing the insights of Freud and especially of Lacan to the domain of psychiatry. And two, that the political and the psychic were fundamentally connected in his work and in his practice. As he always said, Marx and Freud were the two legs of institutional psychotherapy, two complementary figures necessary to understand the world. <clears throat> So the second section is called Marx and Freud in Catalonia. Tosquelles was born in 1912 in Reus, a city south of Barcelona. His student days were marked by the Catalan political and cultural effervescence of the turn of the century. These were vibrant years for the labor movement, a movement that, in which anarchism and syndicalism played a crucial role. Unlike the official communist party, the PCE, the Communist Spanish Party, uh, characterized by its subservience to Moscow, these various anarchist groups preached federalism, decentralization, worker solidarity, self-management, and consciousness raising, particularly through culture. So this was a time, for example, where the, there was a lot of libraries set up for workers, the, the Pau Casals concerts on the streets for workers that you might have heard of also. Um, in 1935, a group of activists from some of these anarchist groups, including Tosquelles, who at the time was 24, founded the PUM. The PUM's politics were in line with the main anarchist organizations of the time, but the new party was especially adamant about denouncing Stalinism and the anti-democratic, authoritarian, and bureaucratic turn that the Soviet Union had taken. According to the PUM leaders, the common term was the perfect example of ideological colonialism, quote, a grotesque attempt to impose the map of Russia over that of Spain. As Tosquelles recalls in various of his books and interviews, the Poom played a foundational role in his political awakening. It taught him to be wary of what he called the, the all power, le tout pouvoir. And so I'm quoting Tosquelles here. Stalin wanted the Poom to join Madrid and spread Spanish propaganda with the monarchy, the military in power, and to say all power to the Soviets. No Republican, no anarchist, no socialist, nothing. To accept centralization was to accept to speak Castellano when the Castilians were our oppressors, or are our oppressors. And these are some of the, just so, some of the posters from the Poom where you see the kind of importance of Catalan also and the, the relationship, the, the, the connection with Catalan um, or separatism and, um, and politics. So as I suggest in the book, it was through his activism in the Poom and through his exposure to Catalan anarchism that Tosquelles became especially interested in imagining new social structures that could, within the confine of the psychiatric hospital, generate other vectors of solidarity and prevent the reappearance of this tout pouvoir. Parallel to his political activism, Tosquelles began medical school and in, 19, in 1927 and chose to specialize in psychiatry a booming field in the Barcelona of the early 20th century. Psychiatric reform had been central to the Catalanist political project, and one of the government's main ambitions was to decentralize psych psychiatric care through the implementation of district divisions that were known as comarcas. 
The idea behind these comarcas was to allow patients who did not require hospitalization to continue living with their families in their natural surroundings outside the walls of the hospital. And this is what in France will be known as, as psychiatrie de secteur, which is still basically what, how French psychiatric services are organized, or sectorisation. And Saint Alban was, uh, played a key role in convincing the French government to take up this idea, which eventually was taken up. <clears throat> Among the most important actors in this Catalan psychiatric reform movement was Tosquelles' teacher, Emilie Mira y Lopez. Mira, who held the first chair of psychiatry at the University of Barcelona, worked at the Pere Mate Institute, where Tosquelles eventually joined him. So this is Mira, this is the Pere Mate, with this kind of gorgeous modernist um, building. And in fact, the architecture of all of these places is really important. I'll come back to it at the end. But, but in this hospital, uh, it was the several little pavilions, and the doctors used the pavilions, uh, again, as a kind of decentralization of the care. Um, as an avid reader of phenomenology, surrealism, and psychoanalysis, Mira incorporated many of these insights into his teaching, his writing, and his medical practice. As Tosquelles recalls, it was Mira who taught him during their clinical briefings at the Peremata to question the idea of a detached and objective psychiatrist and to consider instead the doctor's own transference with the patients and with the hospital. It was also through Mira that Tosquelles first encountered the work of Jacques Lacan, who remained with him throughout his life and who was central to institutional psychotherapy. Lacan convinced Tosquelles that there was no necessary incompatibility between psychiatry and psychoanalysis. And around this time, to deepen his understanding of Freud, Tosquelles began an analysis with Sandor Eminder, an Austrian Jewish doctor who was one of the many Eastern European exiles who had landed in Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona during the 1930s was often described as a small Vienna, so it had a kind of psychoanalytic renaissance or flourishing. Okay, section three, theoretical basis, Simon and Lacan. As he recalled in various interviews, Tosquelles brought two books with him into France in 1939 <coughs> when he escaped the Spanish fascist regime. Jacques Lacan's 1932 thesis on paranoia, oh, sorry, I'll come back, and Hermann Simon's 1929 account of his psychiatric work at the Gütersloh Asylum in Germany. The texts which Tosquelles translated, photocopied, and distributed at Saint Alban before they were readily available to the French public were foundational for the development of the theory and practice of institutional psychotherapy. So these are, <coughs> sorry, some examples from um, from the tech from the archives of Saint Alban uh, of the texts that were circulating. So you see, for example, this is the this is the Simon thesis that I'll talk about in a second, and this is Lacan. You see the price up here because they were actually photocopies that the patients could buy and that the <coughs> other doctors could buy. And, um, and so one of the things I'm really interested in is, again, trying to, to trace the circulation of these texts, right? Who was reading them, how they were, how they were being produced. Simon was well known in psychiatric milieus of the early 20th century for introducing the notion of a more active therapy in the hospital. After noticing that patients became, quote, calm and lucid when they could undertake a small task, no matter how small, Simon began to set up various activities for his patients. As he explained, the three main ills undermining psychiatric care were, one, the patient's lack of activity, two, an unfavorable environment within the asylum, and three, the fundamental belief in the unaccountability of the mentally ill. The French word here is irresponsabilité, so the, lack of, the idea that the mentally ill cannot be responsible, basically, for their own lives. In order to address these problems, Simon advocated building libraries, setting up workshops, and promoting a system of open doors. He also advised nurses and doctors to avoid using a harsh military tone. The goal of his more active therapy was to lead to freedom, a true freedom which was not equivalent to laissez faire, but rather one that would allow his patients to lead a life as independent as possible, as free of immediate assistance as possible. Rather than focusing on the particular symptoms of individuals, it was important to address the whole, the institution, the team, the group. So these are just some examples. And you'll see how at Saint Alban, when I talk about it at the end, they really take up a lot of these ideas that Simon set up, um, some, some of the ergotherapy stations, um, with wool, <coughs> in the gar gardening. And this is 
uh, the schedule of the day, which is pretty much exactly what happens in saint alban and in Laborde. Um, Guattari has a text called La Grille where he talks about this, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but how to organize the day so, so that you wouldn't get fixated on a particular activity and you were sure to shift it around. Lacan's work also played a foundational role for Tusquelles because of its theoretical weight, but also because of the institutional impact it had had within the world of early 20th century European psychiatry. Indeed, before he was known as a psychoanalyst, Lacan was a psychiatrist, in a time and in a context in which adhering to Freud's thesis was not an obvious or an easy choice. After a classical training in neurology and psychiatry, Lacan spent the summer of 1930 as a, as, a, as a resident in the famous Swiss clinic where doctors were developing a new approach to madness that emphasized listening to the patient's account of their lives and ailments in addition to conducting typical nosographic evaluations. As a young medical intern at saint anne immersed in philosophy, phenomenology, and surrealism, Lacan was eager to distinguish himself from the old organicism of his teacher, Edouard Toulouse, who remained a strong proponent of heredity and the degeneration thesis. So in this sense, we can read Lacan's 1932 thesis on paranoid psychosis and its relation to the personality as a kind of theoretical manifesto for a new approach to psychiatry, a psychiatry very close to psychoanalysis. The thesis revolved around the case study of Aimé, a 38-year-old railway clerk who had inexplicably tried to kill a famous actress in Paris. Does madness originate in the brain, as most neuroscientists believe, or in the body, as an acquired disease, or else in the social and familial worlds? Lacan's answer was clear. It is, so I'm quoting Lacan here, it is absurd to attribute these phenomena to a specific neurological automatism. Rather than focusing on a single origin, psychosis needed to be studied in relation to the formation of what Lacan called a personality. Psychiatric clinical work thus needed to open itself to sociological inquiry, to medical examination, and most importantly, to psychoanalytic treatment. Indeed, psychoanalysis was, according to Lacan, the only discipline that was able to provide a coherent theory of the subject, a subject that resulted from conscious and unconscious representations that were constructed in relation to others. And so I think Lacan's argument is really important here. It's not simply that psychiatry should incorporate psychoanalytic um, concepts into its practice, but rather that psychiatry needed to be anchored in a Freudian understanding of the subject and of the unconscious. Um, and this was, this was really sort of innovative, um, not just within psychiatry, um, but also within psychoanalysis, because Freud, when Freud invents uh, psychoanalysis, he, 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 he tells us that it's specifically for neurotics, right? And so the fact that psychoanalysis could all of a sudden help psychotic patients was really something that Lacan uh, was very much invested in. Um, psychotics had a different relation to language and a different relationship to the symbolic. So, so, this, so I, think, I think the thesis really sort of shook both worlds, psychoanalysis and psychiatry at once. Lacan's thesis was not so much rejected from the psychiatric community, but it was essentially ignored. Rather, its early champions were the surrealists who welcomed his innovative approach to madness and discussed it in their journals. And so I think, again, one of the things I think is super interesting is that these, um, that Tosquelles and his colleagues at saint Alban were among the first doctors to read, uh, to, to discuss Lacan. And so I looked through some of the medical journals of the 40s, and, and, and they're, they're writing a series of texts praising Lacan's structural understanding of the subject and of identification of the complex. Um, and you can kind of see that like, you can see how Lacan makes his way into the medical community through these doctors much more. The, the story we're usually told is that he, it's the surrealist story, right? That he goes primarily through the seminar of Kojev and, and people like Bataille, and this is like the, the Elizabeth Rudinesco biography. And that's true, but this is a kind of different story that hasn't been told of transmission. Um, this is, for example, the, um, uh, another, another document I found at the archives at saint Alban, the, the seminar on object relation. Um, which, ha which was only published in 1998, but it was already circulating in these photocopies. So again, with the price to be sold to, you know, in case you wanted to read some Lacan in your free time, <laughs> you could purchase it at the store and at the hospital and read it. So I think again, in terms of thinking about text and context, it's another, it's another story of how these, these texts um, emerged. 
Okay, section four, war psychiatry. In July of 1936, sorry, a few months after the election of the left-wing popular front government, which included the PUM, a group of army officers led by General Francisco Franco staged a military coup which marked the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. Tosquelles joined the Republican resistance with the PUM, and some of you might have read about the PUM during the Spanish War in George Orwell's account, um, because he writes about this extensively, homage to Catalonia. Under the recommendation of Mira, who became an advisor to the Republican Army, Tosquelles was appointed head of military psychiatric services and sent to the Southern Front. In Almodóvar del Campo, he decided to set up a therapeutic community where he tested many of the theories and the practices that he would later develop at Saint Alban. Tosquelles insisted notably on the importance of providing psychiatric care, not only for the civilians and the combatants, but also for the doctors themselves. This holistic approach to psychiatry remained consistent in all of his work, from his endorsement of Lacan's total vision of madness to his interest in Simon's work on the hospital as a holistic institution that needed to be treated and cured. <clears throat> in January of 1939, Barcelona fell to Franco's army, and in March of that year, the fascist's final victory put a tragic end to the Spanish Republic and to the Civil War. In the months that followed, Tosquelles, like many other Republicans, fled Spain and crossed the Pyrenees into France as part of the massive exodus that ca came to be known as the Retirada. France had followed the Spanish Civil War very closely as left and right projected many of their political hopes and fears onto their southern neighbor. Despite the fact that the French government had committed to welcoming Spanish refugees, the defeat of the Popular Front, the growing economic crisis, the rise of xenophobia and anti-Semitism, and the looming war with Germany significantly complicated that promise. As the government headed by Édouard Deladier made clear, France would serve primarily as a place of transit rather than as a permanent home for these Spanish refugees who were often described in official documents as undesirable, racaille. Uh, to that effect, the French government built a series of camps, or they were called special centers at the time, um, to manage for the 450,000 refugees who had reached French soil. Seeking to appease the campaign of fear launched by the extreme right, which immediately con condemned the so-called anarchist scum that had arrived to, in France, the Minister of Interior made national security a priority. I'm sure you're familiar with that pattern. <laughs> he imposed a strict military discipline within the camps and worked closely with the police to weed out potential subversives. When he arrived to France, Tosquelles was placed in one of these camps, the Camp de Jude in the town of Setfond. So this is the town, this is the, the border here, and Setfond is, uh, anyway, it's around here, <laughs> it's here in the town of Garonne. So that's where, um, where, 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 where Tosquelles goes with his, with his like on his Simon book, as he claims. <laughs> uh, living conditions at Setfond were harsh, causing many to die from hunger, disease, and exhaustion, and driving others to suicide. The refugees were amassed in overcrowded barracks surrounded by, by barbed wire, electrical projectors, and surveillance posts. They slept in haystacks with no heat and waited in deplorable sanitary conditions. Many of the testimonies from Setfon also recall the brutal treatment of the guards and the system of surveillance and classifications to which the refugees were subjected. Others discuss the specific psychic effects of the camp and the emergence of new illnesses such as barbed wire disease and arenditis, or sand, arenditis from arena, which means sand, so sanditis, apparently, uh, especially in the camps that were closer to the sea, the, the wind would blow the sand and it, was, it had a kind of maddening effect. As many reports suggest, the camp looked and felt more than anything like a prison. And Tosquelles uses the word carceral concentrationist all the time in his, in his, in, in his accounts to describe this environment. It is, in this it is this concentrationist environment that encouraged Tosquelles to create a psychiatric service within the camp. The war had taught him that psychiatry could be practiced anywhere, so he recruited political activists, artists, and musicians who were imprisoned with him to help him organize activities, concerts, theater productions, publications, but also group therapies that would temper some of the effects of this camp psychosis. 
As Tosqueya is remembered, and I'm quoting him here, there was only one psychiatric nurse. The rest were normal people. I think this is one of the places where I conducted very good psychiatry, in this concentration camp, in the mud, end quote. News of Tosqueya's work in the camp and the, at the front traveled in medical circles and eventually came to the attention of Paul Balvé, the director of saint Alban, who invited Tosqueya to join him in January of 1940. So this is the order uh, requesting Tosqueya to, to come to the hospital. Um, and this is the hospital when Tosqueya arrives. So he arrived at saint Alban in the middle of the Second World War, where he experienced yet another form of occupation. Even though the clinic was located in the free zone, Germany worked closely with the Vichy regime in various administrative matters, including the management of hospital. Balvé, Tosqueyes, and the other doctors at saint Alban were acutely aware of the humanitarian disaster occurring in French psychiatric institutions during the war. So remember the 40,000 dead people that I, patients that I was mentioning and they were determined not to be complicit. saint Alban thus became a center of psychiatric innovation, intellectual effervescence, but also political resistance against Vichy and fascism. And this is why all these people show up there, essentially. Um, Fanon is actually really clear about this when he says that he, he's in medical school in Lyon and he hates um, psych psychi psychiatric practices in France, and he hears about saint Alban and decides that this is the place where he, he can have a, a different relationship to psychiatry. All of the testimonies talk about this. Totalitarianism and concentrationism are recurring terms. Of one of the things that, one of the two things that brought them to this, to this, these psychiatric experiments. So one example here from Jean Ouri, uh, quote: "Institutional psychotherapy is the act of setting up all kinds of mechanisms to fight every day against that which can turn the whole collective towards a concentrationist or segregationist structure." Institutional psychotherapy was, as Tosquet has put it, an attempt to cure life, guérir la vie. Okay, so now that I've set all this up, I can finally tell you what they did at saint Alban. This is the last section. It's called the saint Alban experiment. So the question here is, how do you, how do you systematize this work of, quote, tracking down, tracking the perversions of totalitarian thought? How do you disalienate not only the patients, but the hospital? the psychiatric profession, and the community at large. And this is, I think, where it's, you know, this, this links up nicely to your theme. How do you say no fully, right? <laughs> no, to, no to these totalitarian th uh, rem legacies. Well, according to Tosqueyes and his colleagues, this required a series of very practical measures. It needed to begin at the level of architecture. So the first step was to demolish the walls of the asylum and the division that separated each cell. In line with Simon's teaching, the administration also eliminated uniforms and medical blouses so that the doctors, nurses, and patients were literally indistinguishable from one another. The goal was to, quote, do away with the look of an idle casern or a concentration camp, end quote, but also, from a theoretical perspective, to explode fixed roles, to force the medical staff to consider the singularity of the patient's illness, and so you see how, again, theory and practice are always linked, right? There, there's always a theoretical mission behind the practice, and the practice informs the theory. Each patient who entered the hospital was welcomed by a committee composed of doctors, nurses, and patients who would orient him or her around the castle and explain the logistics of the treatment and of daily life. So this is the brochure um, you can't, that you would get when you arrived at the hospital. It's kind of like this, you know, like a summer camp <laughs> description or something with a map of the hospital activities, uh, a kind of description of the everyday life. If the hospital was to function as a collective soignant, a healing collective, then it needed to develop structures to produce a new social. One of the most important innovations was the Club Paul Balvé. So this was the brochure um, for the club, inviting people to join the club as soon as they felt better. Um, the club was a patient-run cooperative, a sort of union, in charge of organizing all the activities within the hospital. Elected and composed of various subcommittees, the club planned meals, theater, and musical performances, sports, parties, and field trips. Social activities deemed integral to the cure. So these are some of the posters of the kinds of, um, of, uh, of uh, performances that they would have in the hospital. There's some, you can see theater, Afro jazz. <laughs> performances. It also ran the library and the different ergotherapy stations. 
As one observer noted, the atmosphere at the Club Paul Balvé resembled a lively cafe where everybody discussed all the time. According to Tosquelles, the point was to set up, quote, a, a permanent guarantee against the reappearance of oppressive behaviors. And this is where it's very, I think his, his psychiatric work is really close to his political work, um, the kind of, uh, especially of the, during the, the poom during the 1930s, the kind of self-managed, radically democratic and radically uh, anti-authoritarian mission in both cases. The club was responsible for the publication of a weekly journal called Très d'Union. So these are some, I, I chose these two to show you um, because one is by Tosquelles and one is by Fanon. Um, Très d'Union was a collection of texts. The text could be theoretical, literary, poetic, drawings, recipes, advertisements, and letters. Um, the editorial board was composed of patients who were, who were helped by a few staff members, and the journal was published in the hospital itself by a, the printing and binding committee. Once again, Traduignon had both a theoretical and a practical goal. The content was informational, but also philosophically stimulating. As one 1950 editorial put it, quote, to read a journal is a typically social act. It is to exit oneself, to listen to the voice of others, and to take interest in their joys or sorrows, end quote. Reading was a way to reach a broader whole. W-H-O-L. <laughs> uh, the club also coordinated the different activities for the patients that Tosquelles, following Simon, considered foundational to the cure. The work was divided into three categories. Agricultural, so fruit picking, working on the land, overseeing animals in the field. Hospital related, masonry, carpentry, painting, cooking. And ergotherapy stations, pottery, book binding, woodwork. This is the ergotherapy, of course, is the part that the Alpoid people were really excited about also. For their manual labor, patients were paid a minimal amount that they could deposit in the hospital bank and eventually use at the cafe or at the bar. As Tosque has made clear in ergotherapy, the op I'm quoting him, the object that was fabricated does not have a therapeutic value in itself, but it is invested with effective economic and social value that we must help the patient discover. This form of consciousness raising or of discovery of the other is the goal of ergotherapy, end quote. The club, the journal, and the activities at Saint Alban were all designed to facilitate the emergence of a horizontal collectivity. A new space of transference, uh, what the term they used at the time was a, a, a transferential cost constellation, but I think it's very close for those of you who know Guattari's work to what Guattari called trans transversality. Um, they're both trying to think about another, another um, how to think transference on a more kind of global or whole uh, group level. Although the patients also received one-on-one -on -one psychoanalytic ses sessions with doctors, they were invited to participate in the general meetings which had an explicit therapeutic goal. These meetings allowed patients to role play and explore particular fantasies and behaviors. They were attended by nurses, doctors, staff, patients, and were strictly anti-authoritarian. Everybody was invited to speak on any philosophical or personal topic. As one observer recounted, within the space of one month, there were 177 of these meetings held at Saint Alban. And as I was writing this, I was just thinking that probably for a crowd of academics, this is like the worst nightmare <laughs> to have 177 <laughs> meetings, but, but at the time it had a therapeutic goal. Uh, <laughs> so before I conclude, I just want to show you some of the pictures that I took when I visited La Borde, um, the clinic founded on Jean, by Jean Houry, which was probably the most vibrant center of institutional psychotherapy. That's the one that all the French intellectuals, uh, including Deleuze, Guattari, Foucault, visited uh, in the post-war period, and the one that I think it really uh, was central to the production of anti-Oedipus. So this is, uh, this is Laborde. And, and the, the chapter that I'm writing uh, right now deals with uh, Laborde and the kind of close reading of anti-Oedipus as, as a kind of philosophical complement to institutional psychotherapy, uh, really an engagement with the ideas of how you can translate institution, the ideas of institutional psychotherapy on a kind of philosophical level. This is the journal, the, the castle. This is the table where everybody eats outside. So the doctors, the nurses, everybody eats there together, the patients. Uh, so this is the grille I was telling you about, the, the schedule of the day. Uh, which and, and so the idea is, again, to change it around so you don't get fixed on, fixated on doing the dishes or, or <laughs> cooking, and that you would be forced to, to, to change it up to precisely explode fixed rules. 
the schedule for the day again, so the kind of the thing that they distribute to patients in the morning to know what the, so it has things like, you know, we can come back to this, but like the setting the table, cleaning, et cetera, arts. Uh, this is the office of jean Ri. so one of the things I was really interested in, this is actually the tree here, you can't see it, but the tree that I was mentioned, the, the uprooted tree that I, that I wanted to get for the cover. Um, one of the things that is, was, I was very interested was also, again, the production, the, the, the books that are circulating in the libraries and the Ries office, who is reading what. Um, you, see, you see him here with some of the, of the posters from the events at La Borde and the kind of arbrut objects here also in, in the office. Him, here a picture of him, a bourri with a Bonafé, a communist doctor, and Pousquet-Yes. And this is one of the meetings. So Uri, like, it's like everyone sits in a big group like that and, and essentially um, participates. Right. So just to conclude, um, the experiment at Saint Alban was premised on the belief that the social question was also a psychic question and vice versa. The goal of institutional psychotherapy was never to develop a rigid and all-encompassing model that could be exported to other settings, but rather to offer an ethics a way of thinking and living that needed to constantly be readapted and rethought. As Tosquet has put it, and I'm quoting, the work that transforms an establishment of care into an institution, a healing team, into a collective, is never finished, end quote. Institutional psychotherapy had to be a permanent revolution of the social and the psychic at once. And I think Foucault had something really similar in mind when he described Anti-Oedipus as a book of ethics, and in this in the introduction to, to Anti-Oedipus. Uh, being anti-Oedipal was less a belief system than what Foucault called a lifestyle. I'm quoting Foucault here, a way of thinking and living. How do we rid our speech and our acts, our hearts and our pleasures of fascism? How do we ferret out the fascism that is ingrained in our behavior? Again, so how do you say no to fascism, right? Obviously, from a historical point of view, I am a historian after all, we can criticize Foucault's hyperbolization of the term fascism, uh, even though Foucault clarifies that he does not mean the fascism of Hitler and Mussolini, uh, but, the fasc but, the, what was able to um, but the, the thing that was able to mobilize and to use the desire of the masses so effectively, um, the fascism in our heads, as he calls it, the forces that trap our desires, that lead us to identify with authoritarian leaders and to crave law and order. This was another way to address the question of voluntary servitude that had already troubled philosophers such as Laboisie and Spinoza, but that certainly a question that certainly seems relevant to our current political reality. Thank you. Should I take questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I have actually have two questions. I'll just ask them both. They're very different. Yeah. Um, one is, I guess, more historical, and the other is perhaps more theological. The the first one is, I, what is? I'd like to know what the relation between Saint Alban and La Borde is. I mm -hmm. I didn't catch that. Yeah. You mainly focus on Saint Alban, but you then talked about. Yeah. Because I haven't read that fully. I've read right. that so chapter I, 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 I would love you to yeah. trace that out a little bit just because I don't get it. And, um, and then the other question, which is um, maybe more theoretical, or maybe just a misunderstanding on my part, is that uh, my understanding of the way at least most people uh, in my field and in my country use institution from Foucault right. is very, very negative. Institution is completely part of uh, subjectification, yeah. and it, it's complaining constraining and you know and impossible um, and yet it seems like the people you're talking about are using institution in a very different way that it, that that you had a quote right near the end in which they're trying to make something into institution right an institution is actually this place that's livable and so it seems to be almost the opposite of the way people usually understand Foucault is using it yeah great questions um, 
Yeah, this, uh, so the first one is easier. <laughs> uh, the Saint Alban was just the first center. Uh, it was started during World War II. Uri goes there a little bit after the war. I think I forget it's forty-seven or something like that. He does his residency there, and then he goes and opens. He 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 start. He goes to another clinic and then buys La Borte. So it's not. It's more um, like a little uh, a little sister, if you would like. Of La Borte is a kind of little sister to Saint Alban, um, but they they are just. Two of the places where institutional psychotherapy flourishes after World War II. They had a lot of um, connections also institutionally. They, they had, for example, this thing called the Journée de Saint-Alban every, every year, I think, where uh, all of these different doctors would get together and chat about this. Um, there are a couple of other people. Like in Paris, there was a group around Pommel called the Treisième that was also doing some institutional psychotherapy. But So they would kind of meet yearly at Saint-Alban and, and catch up. But, but Saint-Alban was the first place and the other were. But La Borde is, is the most, um, probably the most well-known, I'd say. Because Saint-Alban, you know, it's, it, even though nobody really talked about it that much or nobody really knew about it that much. So that's, why, that's the relationship between the two. Now the second question is, uh, like you put your finger on it, is, you're, you're right. Um, the notion of institution is crucial for these guys. For the, not for, for there's both for Foucault, but as you, you're completely correct in pointing out, Foucault has a much more negative vision of, of, uh, of the institution. Um, why they're invested in the institution is because they, they're very clear to say that they, they don't want to be anti-psychiatry. They don't think that, the, that you can have a subject without an institution, that the subject needs institutions to construct him or herself. So the question is how you rethink the institution, but it's not abolishing the institution. And so these guys are actually extremely critical of Foucault. Uh, Uri, for example, is extremely critical of Foucault. He thinks that he doesn't understand madness, he doesn't understand, uh, and that uh, he thinks that madness is pure social construction, that you can just get rid of, of institutions. So, 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 why, so why am I putting Foucault in this book? Um, it's, it's a, it's, I'm, I'm hesitating. I think he's going to be a, the fourth chapter. Uh, well, first of all, because Conguilhem is there. Um, and again, he has a kind of different position, but, but, I, but he, I think uh, his notions of normal and the pathological are really, uh, really influence these doctors. They talk about it all the time. And because, um, so, so that's why Foucault is in there also kind of like as, a, as an engagement with Conguilhem's idea. But more importantly, I have to, I have to decide because Foucault does talk about Saint Alban positively in his in the psychiatric le le lessons, he says that you know when he's criticizing psychiatry, he says except for Saint Alban, where they're doing something different, where it's a kind of institution that is potentially different. And of course, he writes the preface to Anti Oedipus. So I think Foucault, even though he has a very negative understanding of, of the institution and certainly of, psych of psychiatry, um, he sees these as spaces of of otherness or of, rati of, of potential difference, right? Um, but because these other doctors really don't like him, I don't know if he, if he should be a kind of critical, you know, like a potential fourth chapter of a critique or more in line of with, with, uh, with these thinkers. I mean, the relation between the theorists and the doctors is also complicated because, for example, um, Uri and Guattari also had a kind of falling out uh, and, and, and partly Uri thought that some of the stuff that Guattari was talking about was you know, way out there and that he didn't understand kind of the medical practice. So you, know, you could read Anti-Oedipus. I think Anti-Oedipus is also invested in the role of the institution, but it's complicated, right? It's like, is Anti-Oedipus close to anti-psychiatry or is it actually an engagement with, with a kind of attempt to rescue psychiatry and psychoanalysis from within, right? So I have to think more about this. I mean, I definitely think Foucault is there, but I don't know if he's there as a critic or as, um, you know, or as a kind of problematization of of, of these guys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to ask a question that actually differs a little bit from from Jane's read of Foucault because uh, what I was interested in is the way in which both Foucault and actually sort of Deleuze and Guattari as well, uh, objects uh, figure in, or you know, objects, techne, other kinds of non-humans figure in, in part of both the oppressive nature of institutions and power, but also in the kind of constructive nature. So I'm wondering if you think at all about, for example, the list of tasks, I would be very interested in those, and in what mm. kinds of physical artifacts people get engaged in in those kinds of places or the construction of space, which I think you might talk about a little bit. Um, and just wondered whether with any of these folks, uh, they thought about sort of the therapeutic 
purpose or yeah. function of uh, space objects had to be consistent. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I think that was a, that's definitely how they thought of ergotherapy. Um, and less, I guess, less of the object per se, but more the effective investment in the object and, the, again, the psychic uh, structural role of the object. Um, and the space is really interesting because, for example, at the Peremata, so it, it's, it has the main, the, the, sh the pavilion I showed you and lots of little pavilions, and they would use the architecture of the pavilions to sort of divide the groups and to do these group meetings. And this is why, for example, in the, in the brochures for La Bob, you see them, uh, again, we capitalize on the space, right, the, the different little sections as part of the, <laughs> of the decentralization, if you'd like, of the, of the main. But, but what do you have in mind when you were talking about the objects, the role of the objects for Foucault and, and Deleuze? I was just curious. Well, I, mean, I think that Foucault is very concerned with uh, how space and technology work in, work in practice as a discipline. For right. I see um, what you're saying, yeah. And then similarly, I think with, uh, I mean, I think with uh, D&D, &D, I would see it <laughs> more the affective uh, af elements of objects, but certainly uh, not human figure, I think, fairly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's that's great. Yeah. I was wondering if you could tell a little bit more about the role of the time pressure here in the establishment of this uh, type of therapy in the school. Yeah. And at the same time, I was wondering if you, there could be any parallels with the time pressure being situated in Europe and if that's having any impact in the schools of uh, psychotherapy at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is, well, the, the, the Spanish refugees, um, I mean, Tosquillas, Tos, why I spent so much time on this, on this, on the Spanish refugees is because Tosquillas himself uh, claims that his experience in the Spanish camp was foundational for his work. Um, and so he, that really like, this kind of occupation, the physicality and the psychic uh, effects of the camp were what convinced him that there was, a, that the, the camp had a psychic effect. And that in order to, to and, and that the asylum was very close to the camp. I mean, you know, they were, I mean, in, in very practical effects, they were treating people often like uh, patients, mentally ill patients, as if it was a, a, a concentration, I mean, tying them to the radiators and things like that during the war. So, so there, the conditions were, that he thought were very similar. So that's why, um, uh, and, and, and there has been a lot of work recently in French history about the Spanish refugee camps, the kind of stuff that was happening. And, and apparently there was these, these moments, these kind of attempts to have a kind of cultural life like Tosquillas um, attempted to do. Obviously there was a lot of artists and intellectuals who were in the camp, so, so that helped to create these, these, um, these artistic... Uh, this case was also really, really proud of being a Catalan. So the the, the, the Catalan, I don't know if this is what you're getting to, but the uh, the Catalans are really love Tosquillas because it's kind of like putting Catalonia at the origins of French theory, <laughs> which is uh, so. But the 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 um, the part about the the, the recent camp, yes, I think that definitely. I mean, conver I mean, they, this the, the the recent anthropology and and political science around the, the, the camp structure is very much present. This is one of the things I'm interested in thinking about um, and dialoguing with that, that, that scholarship around uh, uh, what the, the, stru uh, the structure of the camp and, and, how, and how that, and it's certainly relevant to the refugee crisis today. It certainly is um, something that is, has not been resolved and the psychic effects, I think, of camps and of refugee life is still very, are still very much with us. There's an anthropologist um, who were, I was working on Italy and Fanon and refugee camps that I haven't read yet, but I want to read uh, kind of uses of, of Fanon and, and camps. I'm forgetting her name now, but uh, but there has been a, a little bit of work thinking about um, psychiatric effects of of refugee camps in more contemporary times. Yeah. Um, thanks, I really enjoyed the talk. I, I want to build on the question again about the institution a little bit. Yeah. Um, when French intellectuals, maybe more than the doctors, um, make these broader claims about challenging the institutional life of the time, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the psychiatric environment, but were, were they trying to do something more broadly about institutions at that, in that era or not? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, th this is again where the theory and the practice are complicated because, for example, uh, during May 68, someone like Jean Henri was quite critical of the students. I mean, like Lacan for that matter, right? Because it's the idea is that uh, the attempt to destroy, to, to, to get rid of the institution is not the way to do it. <laughs> that you're gonna replace it with another kind of authoritarianism or something like that. So to think about uh, institutions as being necessary. Uh, so, so of course they're working within this, the confines of the hospital, but they did have an idea that this could translate into political institutions more, more broadly. It's not as spelled out as I wish it were, it were you know. Um, it's more suggestive, but I think certainly the, the intellectuals that are interested in them were interested, I mean, someone like, like Watari, for example, was certainly interested in this project to, to think about uh, institutions politically more broadly. And, and in the case of Guattari, all of his political activism, which he was extremely active in all these groups, um, was always in dialogue with, 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 with institutional psychotherapy. But you know, they were reading, they were very much, they were in conversation with people like Bazag, they were with the, with the anti-psychiatry in the US, anti-psychiatry in Britain, uh, but they were very, very clear that this was not what they were doing. They used medicine, for example. They had no problem using um, you know, electroshocks. So, so it's not like they were opposed to, they didn't think madness was, again, a social construction. They didn't think it was all like uh, an attempt to, to subjectify people. They did think there was a reality uh, to mental illness that needed to be treated and, and that the institution was foundational, not just for psychotic, but for everybody, that you needed institutions to construct yourself. But there's a kind of utopian nature yeah. of the institution that they're Exactly, definitely. That's, that's why I was linking this stuff to the common, right, to the stuff about the common. I mean, I think they're trying to imagine a vertical, and I mean, I don't know what it looks like, but it would, they would, they're trying to imagine a, a form of institution that would be exploded, that would be more vertical, and that would be, I mean, I get the critique, I'm not sure what it looks like, but, but I think they're, but, but I do think that's what they're trying to imagine, like a, re, a, a different common. Yes. <laughs> one that is, of course, one that is, uh, you said, one that channels emotion and a love of story. But, you know, fascism changes over time as well. And that a lot, you know, what we know about fascism today is that it was actually, in many ways, very liberating for a lot of people, yes. sexually. Yep. Uh, and also that it was one that was anti authority, anti conservative, yes. anti traditional. So, is this something that then you're, are you going to publish? Definitely, definitely. I mean, and, and this and the fascism stuff, you know, I was always like more annoyed by those references before because I was like, oh, it's of course, of course 68, they're not living under fascism. <laughs> but now I'm actually like, I think there's something, um, I mean, what they mean is in this particular, in anti-Oedipus, I think they mean capital, kind of capitalism, but, but also they're really, in, in, in anti-Oedipus, uh, Deleuze and Guattari are really wrestling with the limits of May 68, um, with why the revolution was aborted. So the idea is that you know, the unions, the Communist Party, doesn't go all the way. They don't do the freeing of life. They don't do the kind of, so why is it that, they, that people want their own, desire their own servitude again and again? And you know, whether we want to call this fascism or not, I, I don't know, but certainly that voluntary servitude exists as a structure. And I think it's, um, and I think you're entirely right. I mean, I think um, they're, what, what, what interests me about, about at least Deleuze and Guattari, is that they understand fascism, as you say, as a, as a revolutionary, it's not a conservative movement, as a revolutionary movement, as an inner experience, right? And this is where Marxism and, and liberalism are both useless in their understanding of fascism in some ways, because liberalism just thinks it's, uh, you know, ir they, it, liberalism cannot deal with the irrationality of fascism. Marxism thinks it's a, a displacement of something else. And we go back to the you know, false consciousness model. They voted against their interests. No, this was a desire, right? So how do we think of this? If this desire exists, um, they're taking that desire seriously. And in Antidepus, it's called Oedipalization. Like Deleuze and Guattari say, look, we're not saying that psychoanalysis imposes Oedipus. 
Psychoanalysis is just legitimizing Oedipus. We want Oedipus as fascism, right? We want Oedipus. So the question is, how can the left figure out a way to channel that desire into a project that's not gonna be fascism? And this is where I think we're really at, again. <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, they're not the only ones. I think feminism was very much engaged with this, again, in the 60s and 70s, but, but a kind of a, a libidinal understanding of politics. Um, and again, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know the solution, but I, I think, again, the diagnosis is right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a, I'm wondering about the recent experience. Um, since you, you opened with the, the recent actual narrative of other kinds of institutions, of several of psychotherapeutic institutions during the war, and how horrifying they were, and even during the kind of war on um, high death rates. Um, and, and you're the people that you're looking at really blur the distinction between um, doctor and patient. Yeah. Right? In a way, this is almost convenient, right? Of They're course. all clinical patients, and this is for everyone. Um, but do you have, you know, is there any kind of documentation or sources? You, of course, many wonderful reformists, prison projects and other things, had beautiful and political ideas behind them that turned out, you know, in the practical experience of, of prisoners to be not so pleasant, right? Yeah. So I'm curious if you have any information about that. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have the patient experience partly because it's, imp it's very hard to get to because the, the, I mean, first of all, the medical files are closed for I don't know how many years, but many, many years. And secondly, I don't have that many testimonies. I mean, I only have the testimonies of the people I had with when I was there. Um, and, and I'm really, but I am very careful, I, I, you know, that when I'm, as I'm writing this book, I'm trying to be really careful to not go into hagiography because I don't think, I'm not a... <laughs> I think what's been written about this movement has either been hypercritical or hyperhagiographical. And I'm in neither position. Like I, I think it's a more of an interesting moment in political history. But I think it has <coughs> serious um, problems theoretically. And, and, and one of them is, you know, the, the I mean, it was, it was all men. It was all, uh, it was very um, misogynist in many ways. They were all, you know, even though they tried to explode fixed roles, et cetera, uh, at the end of the day, there was a doctor who kind of had the knowledge. I mean, the, you know, the question is how much you can reconstruct these things. But, um, but the patient experience, I think, was very varied. I mean, some people felt much better. Some people didn't. That was, that's my impression. And, it, and, and the patient um, level of illness really sh varied, too. Some people were just kind of depressed and <laughs> hanging out at La Borde. Other were serious schizophrenics. Um, and one of the questions is, you know, does it work to, to kind of have a theory for everyone at the same time? Um, these experiments have also, and I mean, it, they're done now. Uh, La Bordouri died a few years ago, uh, and it, it seems like that was one of the last remaining. Post Saint Alban is a normal hospital now, with like, just all of this kind of attempt at reform is gone. Um, and one of the questions is why it ended. You know, the French medical. Uh, state psychiatry did incorporate a lot of the features of institutional psychotherapy, like the open door policy, like the day hospitalizations, like sectorizations, and the the, the possibility of combining psychoanalytic treatment with psychiatric treatment. So all of that is now part of the norm, but it's also you know uh, there's also we're also back to a kind of uh, closeness between the psychiatric hospital and the prison. <laughs> I mean certainly in this country, but. Um, but in France too. So, so yeah. I mean, I think it really varied at the level of the patients. Um, but I haven't. There's been a few little accounts, and I'll, you know, I know I, I talk about them. But, but and those have been mostly really positive. <laughs> but I haven't heard about the ones who, who, who have been less positive. Yeah. The, uh, um, in terms of the, the history of this uh, type of work. Uh, one also has to consider what was happening in Zurich um, at the turn of the century with yeah. Euler at Berkholzli. That's who I was meant. That's where like Kant did his clinical. Oh, okay. yeah. So that, that was the same Berkholz. idea. That exactly. Euler wanted the uh, doctors to uh, not wear uniforms and to be with the patients yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And also, in terms of the history, uh, we have to consider that uh, there was there has been a basic split in the psychoanalytic world between. Jung and Freud, and in terms of uh, Freudian being more oriented toward the neurotic, it was Jung who uh, really worked with the schizophrenics and looked for their personal story 
and that sort of stuff. Huh. So that, um, and so <laughs> Jung's whole uh, ability to work with the psychotics and their imaginal realm really uh, kind of put him in a domain yes. of being re able to relate to the surrealists, et cetera. Um, so, and in Europe, uh, well, actually in, in uh, uh, psychoanalysis is not just the Freudians, it's the Adlerians and the Jungians as well. Yeah. So. It's hard because I, I, yeah, I think this is really, this is, uh, and, and as I said, like Lacan spends, I think the summer of 1930 at Kukursi, and this is where he, he comes back to France after that kind of full of new ideas of, um, of how to do psychiatric work. But he, but um, it, <laughs> Jung, Jung and Adler, all the other ones are, I mean, basically nobody else is a reference when you have Lacan in the room, <laughs> you know, there's a kind of, uh, and 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 Guattari and for for and Anouri for that matter, are very much Lacanians. I mean, they think that Lacan got it right in the sense that his rereading of Freud is right, his re rethinking of the unconscious is right, um, and that uh, everybody else. Um, so you, they, they they it's not like they don't read other people, but they're in that particular group. Uh, with the Lacanian wave, it's hard to have a kind of to integrate other perspectives. <laughs> I would say into that conversation. So I haven't seen any, I mean, I, it would be interesting, but I haven't seen any references to Jung, for example. I think Antioedipus has a few references to Jung, but, but, um, but certainly not in, Tuskayes is not, it's not a figure that, that is important for, for, um, for just, Jung is not a figure who's, that's important. M more, more Adler, if anything, um, and for Fanon Adler too, but, but, um, but one of the things that they find really interesting in Lacan is also the attention to language. Um, this is one of the things that they try to do all the time in their own work is to think about a different, a different symbolic, a psychotic symbolic, and this is why they're, they're trying to rethink transference with this architecture, with these groups, et cetera, to try to, to, to devise a way for language to express itself differently. But yeah, I mean, you're right. It's a very, it's a very, it's a, it's a very specific Freud and Lacan story, and that doesn't include a lot of different uh, psychoanalytic traditions. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. A very small uh, uh, question. Uh, I noticed in the, the journal, the Trevignon. Yeah. The, in the Fanon <coughs> uh, excerpt, anyway, it said this. Paper is not to circulate outside of the hospital. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> it's the very top there. Where is it? Uh, the yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I was just wondering what that was about. <laughs> You're accusing her of writing. <laughs> so it's so interesting. And it was just republished in the Fanon, in the Fanon uh, anthology. Well, it was also a quota in quotation. I, I don't know, I just I couldn't read the, the rest, so I was but anyway. Yeah. That is really interesting. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, again, I don't think the idea was to sell it to the public, you know, but. but it seems also odd to sell it to the people inside the hospital, which is, then you would think, you know. But who knows? Yeah, I mean, again, it has the price, you see, <laughs> this one. It's like the other, uh, the photocopies where everything is part of, the, the money is part of the circulation and the. Um, yeah, but that is interesting. Because the other one doesn't have that, so I don't know if it was an evolution from. I'll have to look at the other ones that I have and see if it, all of a sudden they started to put this. So whether they talked about patients, I don't know, I could imagine you didn't want. I, I'm assuming, but, but they didn't really care that much about confidentiality because it, it was an open door policy so everybody could go out. And again, I, I, I can't imagine there would be that much interest in the journal outside of the... I mean, it's not available in any library or anything like that, so it's only at the hospital itself. So. Um, but but now they have been republished in the Fanon texts, and so who knows? <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking of the uh, definition of fascism and, and so on, and, and where we are now. Uh, one of the I think important definitions is that it's the union of corporations with the government, and if you look at the power of uh, international corporations and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
and, and what that is doing, what those systems are doing to our society, and Trump is one of the, the consequences of that. So yeah. um, I suspect we'll switch from that to some different things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think, but the, but I think here again, it's less of it's less a macro sort of analysis than a, than an understanding of fashion that I said as an inner experience of something that would that would appeal to this the you know the uh, kind of regener a sublimity as kind of regenerative violence and a regenerative that that um, that fascism was really able to capitalize on. And this is and this is where you know when you think about <coughs> the. This, you know, the, like something like the debates, even the presidential debates, and you see someone like, um, you know, the, the kind of effective appeal of Trump and versus Hillary Clinton's response, which is in some ways more rationalism, right? More reason, more reason. <laughs> and so, uh, so I don't know. Like the question, I think, is sort of, can you can you imagine a way to counter that libidinal energy or that effective drive or that that would. Um, not be fascist, <laughs> that would veer into this kind of egalitarian, anti-authoritarian, um, horizontal vision of society, and that would provide the kind of regenerative experience of the self that is what fascism was so able to, to propose or to offer. But I don't know. <laughs> well, on that optimistic note, uh, <laughs> please join me in thanking Professor Lipson. Thank you.